Diogenes of Sinope, human dog, philosopher, good for nothing. Once he called out loud, Hey there, people! And as they ran up to him, he worked them over with his staff with the words, I called for people, not riffraff. To approach one another with a smile full of understanding would be a misunderstanding. Diogenes, who we have before us here, is not at all an idyllic dreamer in his tub, but a dog that bites when he feels like it. He is one of those who simultaneously bark and bite, and do not pay much attention to proverbs. His bite sank so deep into the most highly treasured values of Athenian civilization that since then no satirist could be trusted. The memory of his bites belongs to the most vivid impressions retained from antiquity. For this reason, the humorous approval of this philosophy by many an ironically minded citizen almost always rests on a belittling misunderstanding. In the citizen there is a caged wolf who sympathises with the biting philosopher. But Diogenes sees above all a citizen in his sympathiser and he bites all the same. Theory and praxis are incalculably interwoven in his philosophy, and there is no room for mere theoretical agreement. Even mere practical imitation would not please him. He would probably think it was stupid. He is impressed only by characters whose presence of mind, quick wit, alertness and independent feeling toward life are a match for his. His suggestive success rests not least of all on the fact that he was a teacher who wanted no pupils who imitated him. In this he resembles the Japanese Zen masters whose effect is achieved by teaching through non-teaching. We could not picture his external appearance today or gain an impression of his effect on the Athenian government if we did not have the visual instruction of the hippies, freaks, globetrotters and metropolitan Indians. He is a wild, witty, cunning sort. Part of the standard picture as it is handed down from antiquity is that the kinnock must be without possessions, mostly involuntarily by birth, and then on top of that voluntarily whereby an impression of sovereignty arises. Everything kinnocks own they carry with them. For Diogenes and his kind this means an all-weather all coat, a staff, a knapsack with the smallest personal effects, including probably a toothpick, a pumice for cleansing the skin, a drinking vessel made of wood, the feeder and sandals. This outfit, when it was chosen by free citizens, was somewhat shocking, especially at a time when it was considered disgraceful for an Athenian to appear in public unaccompanied by slaves. That Diogenes had a beard is self-evident, even if it is not so much a matter of a proper beard, but rather the unshavenness of many decades. Diogenes' influence on his contemporaries, however, was not a question of aesthetics. A dishevelled appearance says little when, on the other hand, it is known that the Athenian upper-class whores granted the unkempt philosopher exclusive and unpaid favours that other poor suckers at most only dreamed about. Between Lais and Freyn, the star courtesans of the Attic capital, and Diogenes, it seems there were laws of giving and taking that the normal citizen who has to pay cash for everything does not understand. Freyne? Lais and Freyne? Hmm. To call him an ascetic would be incorrect because of the false undertones the word asceticism has assumed through a thousand year long masochistic misunderstanding. We have to rid the word of its Christian connotations to rediscover its fundamental meaning. As free of need as Diogenes appears, he could be taken rather as the original father of the idea of self-help, and thus as an ascetic in the sense that he was a self-helper by distancing himself from a self-helper by distancing himself from and being ironic about needs 
for whose satisfaction most people pay with their freedom. He, who provided the impulse for kinesism, introduced the original connection between happiness, lack of need, and intelligence into Western philosophy, a theme that can be found in all Vita simplex movements in world cultures. As the original hippie and proto-bohemian, Diogenes has left his mark on the European tradition of intelligent living. His spectacular poverty is the price of freedom. That must be understood. If he could be well off without sacrificing his freedom, he would not have objected at all. But no wise man can let himself be made a fool of by so-called needs. Diogenes taught that the wise man too eats cake, but only if he can just as well do without it. A dogmatism of poverty does not come into question. It is rather a matter of discarding false weights, which hinder one's freedom of movement. Self-torture is definitely a stupidity for Diogenes. Still more stupid, of course, from his point of view, are those who spend their whole lives running after something they already have. Citizens struggle with the chimera of ambition and strive for riches that in the last analysis they cannot enjoy any more than what is enjoyed in the elementary pleasures of the clinical philosophy, as a daily recurring matter of course, lying in the sun, observing the goings on in the world, being glad, having nothing to wait for. Since Diogenes was one of those philosophers of life, for whom life is more important than writing, it is understandable why not a single authentic line from him has been preserved. Instead a garland of anecdotes lives on around him that say more about his influence than his writing could do. More about his influence than any writing could do. Whether he really composed some writings, such as the politics and the seven tragedy parodies as claimed by tradition, is left aside here. In any case, his significance does not lie in writings. His existence is absorbed in the anecdotes he provoked. In them he became a mythical figure. Witty and instructive stories buzz around him, as they do around his colleague, Mullah Nasruddin, in the Sufian satire. Precisely that proves his real existence. The most vital people thrust themselves on their contemporaries, and even more on posterity as projection figures, and attract a definite direction of fantasy and thinking to themselves. They stimulate people's curiosity as to what it would be like to be in the skin of such a philosopher. Therefore they not only gain pupils, but also attract people who carry their living impulse further. This curiosity with regard to Diogenes' existence seized even the greatest military hero of antiquity, Alexander of Macedonia, who was reputed to have said that he would want to be Diogenes if he were not Alexander. Alexander. <clears throat> this shows the heights, both political and existential, to which the philosopher's influence reached. In the attempt to express Diogenes' intentions in modern language, we automatically approach existential philosophy. However, Diogenes does not talk about existence, decision, absurdity, atheism, and such key words of modern existentialism. The ancient Diogenes is ironic about his philosopher colleagues, poking fun not only at how they torture themselves with problems, but also at their credulity regarding concepts. His existentialism does not go primarily through his head, he experiences the world as neither tragic nor absurd. There is not the slightest trace of the melancholy around him, which clings to all modern existentialism. His weapon is not so much analysis as laughter. He uses his philosophical competence to mock his serious colleagues. As anti-theoretician, anti-dogmatist, anti-scholar, he emits an impulse that resounds everywhere where thinkers strive for a knowledge for free people. Free also from the strictures of a school, and with this he begins a series in which names like Montaigne, Voltaire, Nietzsche, Feyerabend, and others appear. Feyerabend? Abend? It is a line of philosophizing that suspends the esprit de sérieux. 
How Diogenes' existentialism is to be understood is still best shown in the anecdotes. The danger of underestimating the philosophical content of kinicism, precisely because it has been handed down only anecdotally, is great. That even great spirits of the calibre of Hegel and Schopenhauer have fallen into this trap can be gleaned from their presentations of the history of philosophy. Hegel, above all, was blind to the theoretical content of a philosophy that finds ultimate wisdom precisely in not having a theory for the decisive things in life, and that teaches instead to undertake the risk of existence consciously and serenely. Legend has it that the young Alexander of Macedonia one day sought out Diogenes, whose fame had made him curious. He found him taking a sunbath, lying lazily on his back, perhaps close to an Athenian sports field. Others say he was gluing books. The young sovereign, in an effort to prove his generosity, granted the philosopher a wish. Diogenes' answer is supposed to have been, Stop blocking my son. That is perhaps the most well-known philosophical anecdote from Greek antiquity, and not without justice. It demonstrates in one stroke what antiquity understands by philosophical wisdom. Not so much a theoretical knowledge, but rather an unerring, sovereign spirit. The wise man of long ago knew best of all the dangers of knowledge that lie in the addictive character of theory. All too easily they draw intellectuals into the ambitious stream where they succumb to intellectual reflexes instead of exercising autonomy. The fascination of this anecdote lies in the fact that it shows the emancipation of the philosopher from the politician. Here, the wise man is not, like the modern intellectual, an accomplice of the powerful, but turns his back on the subject of principle of power, ambition, and the urge to be recognised. He is the first one who is uninhibited enough to say the truth to the prince. Diogenes' answer negates not only the desire for power, but the power of desire as such. It can be interpreted as an abridgment of a theory of social needs. Socialised human beings lost their freedom when their edu educators succeeded in instilling wishes, projects and ambitions in them. These latter separate them from their inner time, which knows only the now, and draw them into expectations and mem memories. Alexander, whose hunger for power drove him to the borders of India, found his master in an outwardly insignificant, indeed down-and-out, philosopher. In reality, life is not to be found with the activists or in the mentality of security. Here, the Alexander anecdote comes close to Jesus' simile about the birds in the heavens who neither sow nor harvest, yet live as the freest creatures under God's heaven. Diogenes and Jesus are united in their irony, directed at social labour that exceeds the necessary measure, and merely serves to extend power. What for Jesus was taught by the birds, was for Diogenes taught by a mouse. It became his model for self-sufficiency. Just as the Alexander anecdote highlights the philosopher's attitudes towards the powerful and the insatiable, the famous episode with the lantern illustrates his stance vis-a-vis -vis his fellow citizens in Athens. One day, in broad daylight, the philosopher lit a lamp, and as he was asked on his way through the town what he was doing, the answer was, I'm looking for people. This episode provides the masterpiece of his pantomimic philosophy. The seeker of people with his lantern does not couch his doctrine in a complicated, cultivated language. Seen in this light, Diogenes would certainly be the most humanitarian philosopher of our tradition. Popular, graphic, exoteric, plebeian, to a certain extent, the great grok of antiquity. However, as affably as Diogenes behaves in his existential didactic procedure, just as biting, indeed misanthropic, to his ethics turn against the inhabitants of the polis. Laetius emphasises the special talent of our philosopher to show contempt, a sure sign of a strong, morally critical irritability. He pursues an idea of humanity that he scarcely finds realised in his fellow human beings. 
If true human beings are those who remain in control of their desires and live rationally in harmony with nature, it is obvious that urbanised social human beings behave irrationally and inhumanely. They indeed require the philosopher's light even in daylight to orient themselves in the world. As a moralist, Diogenes appears in the role of the doctor to society. His harshness and roughness since that time have been interpreted ambiguously, either as poisons or as medicine. Where the philosopher appears as therapist, he inevitably encounters resistance from those who refuse his help, or even more likely, denounce him as a troublemaker, or as... pardon me. Or even more likely, denounce him as a troublemaker, or as the one who really needs to be healed. A structure that can be observed everywhere today where therapists confront the disease-producing relations of their society. In a way that inevitably reminds one of Rousseau, the philosopher with the lantern declares his fellow citizens to be social cripples, misinformed, addicted beings who in no way correspond to the image of the autonomous, self-controlled and free individual according to which the philosopher tries to shape his own life. This is the therapeutic foil to social unreason. In its exaggeration, there is a misanthropic side, just as its practical effect may be to balance and humanise. This ambivalence cannot be resolved theoretically. And whether Diogenes as a person was more misanthrope than philanthrope, whether in his satire there was more cynicism than humour, more aggression than cheerfulness, can, in any case, no longer be decided from our historical distance. I believe everything points towards underscoring in the figure of Diogenes, the sovereign, humorous philosopher of life who, in Erich Fromm's words, is driven by a biophilic disposition to sarcastically take human stupidities to task. Enlightenment in antiquity tends to manifest itself in quarrelsome figures who are capable of reacting in an uncivil way to the spectacle of false living. Diogenes appears in the period of the decay of the Athenian urban community. It is the eve of Macedonian rule with which the transition to Hellenism begins. The old small-scale, patriotic ethos of the polis is caught in its own dissolution, which loosens the bonds of individuals to their citizenship. And what was earlier the only conceivable place for sensible life now shows its obverse side. The city now becomes a melting pot of absurd customs, a hollow political mechanism whose functioning can now all at once be seen through as if from the outside. All but the blind must recognise that a new ethos and a new anthropology are now needed. One is no longer a narrow-minded citizen of a random city community, but must understand oneself as an individual in an extended cosmos. To this extended cosmos corresponds geographically the new broad trading network of the dawning Macedonian world empire. Culturally, the Hellenistic civilization around the eastern Mediterranean. Existentially, the experience of emigration, of migration, of being an outsider. Of Diogenes, it is said, asked about his hometown, he answered, I am a citizen of the world. This grandiose new concept contains the boldest answer in antiquity to its most unsettling experience reasons becoming homeless in the social world, and the separation of the idea of true living from the empirical communities. Where socialization for the philosopher becomes synonymous with the unreasonable demand to be satisfied with the partial reason of one's own random cultures, and to join in the collective irrationality of one's own society, there the Kinnock's refusal has a utopian significance. With their demand for a rational vitality, those who refuse shut themselves in against objective absurdities. 
The Kinnock thus sacrifices his social identity and forecoes the psychic comfort of unquestioned membership in a political group in order to save his existential and cosmic identity. He individualistically defends the universal against the, at best, half-rational collective particular that we call state and society. In the concept of citizen of the world, ancient kinicism passes on its most valuable gift to world culture. The only true order of state I find is in the cosmos. Cosmopolitan sages as bearers of living reason will accordingly only be able to integrate themselves unreservedly into a society when it has become a world polis. Until then, their role is inevitably that of subversives. They remain the biting conscience of every dominating self-satisfaction and the affliction of every local narrowing. The legend of Diogenes, which also provides us with all kinds of funny pictures, further reports that our philosopher, in order to prove his autonomy, made his home in a vat or a tub, whether that sounds like a fairy tale or not. The explanation that possibly it was not a vat in our case of the word, but rather a cistern or a walled container for water or grain hardly detracts from the story. For no matter how all the ominous vat was shaped, what is important here is not its appearance, but what it signifies when in the middle of the world city, Athens, a man who was held to be wise decided to live in it. He is also said to have slept under the roof of the Hall of Columns of Zeus, ironically marking that the Athenians ironically remarking that the Athenians had probably erected the building especially for him as an abode. Alexander the Great is said to have stood before the philosopher's residential container and cried out with admiration, O oh, vat full of wisdom! What Diogenes demonstrates to his fellow citizens through his lifestyle would be designated now as a regression to the level of an animal. Because of this, the Athenians, or perhaps it was the Corinthians, derogatorily called him dog, for Diogenes had reduced his requirements to the living standards of a domestic pet. In doing so, he had freed himself from civilization's chains of needs. He thus also turned the Athenians' nickname around against them and accepted the insult as the name of his philosophy. One must recall this when one hears the quintessence Diogenes is supposed to have drawn from his doctrine. To the question of what gain philosophy had brought him, he said, if nothing else, then at least to be prepared for every vicissitude. Sages show that they can live literally anywhere, because in any place they are in harmony with themselves and the laws of nature. To the present day, this is the decisive attack against the ideology of home beautiful and comfortable estrangement. This does not necessarily mean that Diogenes would have to nourish resentment against comfort and cosy homes. However, those who want to be prepared for every vicissitude would understand comfort as a passing episode, like any other situation. That the philosopher was serious about this view, he could of course prove to his fellow citizens only in the tub, because a comfortably situated Diogenes would never have had as great an impact as this, as this impoverished, declassed wise man at the nadir of architecture. In the later Stoa, where, he is, where in matters of possession, chemical principles were cited absolutely, habere ut non, have as if you did not have, one often did not know how it was really intended, for one indeed had, and seen on the whole, Stoicism was a philosophy of the comfortable. Diogenes, however, really was without possessions, and he could convincingly shake his contemporaries' consciousness, as later on Christian soil, the Franciscans first were able to do again. In modern language, what in Diogenes upset his contemporaries could be expressed succinctly. Rejection of the superstructure. Überbau, Verweigerung. 
<coughs> Uber Bau Verweigerung. Superstructure in this sense would be what civilization offers by way of comfortable seductions to entice people to serve its ends. Ideals. Ideas about duty. Promises of redemption. Hopes for immortality. Goals for ambition. Positions of power. Careers. Arts. Riches. From a clinical perspective, they are all compensations for something. A Diogenes does not let himself be robbed of in the first place. Freedom. Awareness. Joy in living. The fascination of the clinical mode of life is its astounding, indeed almost unbelievable, serenity. Those who have subjected themselves to the reality principle watch perplexed and annoyed at the same time. But also fascinated. The activities of those who, so it seems, have taken the shorter path to authentic life. And to avoid the long detour of culture to the satisfaction of needs. Like Diogenes who used to say, it is divine not to need anything, and semi-divine to only need a little. The pleasure principle functions for the wise in a way similar to that for normal mortals, however. Not because they get pleasure from the possession of objects, but because they realise how dispensable objects are, and thus they remain in the continuum of vital contentedness. With Diogenes, this pleasure pyramid, in which one only surrenders a lower form of pleasure in favour of a higher form, is evident. Yet here lies also the easily misunderstood point in clinical ethics. It easily finds followers among masochistically inclined people who, through asceticism, get a chance to express their resentment against what is living. Lebendig. Lebendig. The ambivalence will mark out the further course of clinical sects. With Diogenes, clinical serenity still speaks for itself. It is the riddle on which those who suffer under an all too well known discontent in the culture labour, including Sigmund Freud, who went so far as to claim that happiness was not provided for in the plan of creation. Would not the Diogenes, the proto kinnic be the most appropriate person to stand as a living witness against the great psychologist's resignation? A mild variant of cynicism. The political barb of the clinical offensive only reveals itself in a last group of anecdotes about Diogenes the Shameless. Diogenes the political animal. Now, this has nothing to do with what Aristotle understands by a zoon politicon. The human being is a social entity that can only experience its individuality in relation to society. The expression animal is to be taken more literally than the translation of zoon as living being allows. The emphasis is on animality, the animal side and animal basis of human existence. Political animal, this term outlines the platform of an existential anti-politics. Diogenes, the shameless political animal, loves life and demands a natural, not an exaggerated, but an honourable place for the animal side, where the animal side is neither suppressed nor excessively elevated. A discontent in the culture becomes impossible. Life energy must rise from below and flow unobstructedly, even in the wise. For the person who loves life, like Diogenes, the reality principle takes on a different form. Ordinary realism stems from fearfulness and a peevish putting up with necessities that the system of needs prescribes for socialised beings. According to tradition, Diogenes lived to a ripe old age, more than 90 years. For a philosopher who was a student of ethics and regarded only embodiment as valid, this fact functions like proof in his favour. Some say that Diogenes poisoned himself by gnawing on the raw bone of an ox. Well, this is surely the version told by his opponents who maliciously emphasise the risks of a simple life. Perhaps they reveal thereby that Diogenes extended the critical spark against civilization 
even to eating customs, even to eating customs, playing off the raw against the cooked, and therefore could have been a forerunner of the modern proponents of raw foods and natural diet. According to the version disseminated by his pupils, Diogenes died by holding his breath, which of course would be an excellent proof of his superiority in living as in dying. Diogenes' shamelessness cannot be understood at first glance. Although it seems to be explained on the one hand by a philosophy of nature, naturalia non sunt turpia, its real point lies in its political socio-theoretical arena. Shame is the most intimate social fetter which binds us before all concrete rules of conscience to universal standards of behaviour. Existential philosophers, however, cannot remain satisfied with the socially prescribed conditioning and shame. They return once more to the beginning of the process. What a person really has to be ashamed of is by no means settled by social conventions, especially because society itself is suspected of being based on perversions and irrationalities. The cynic thus serves notice on being led by the nose, by deeply ingrained commandments regarding shame. The customs, including those dealing with shame, could after all be perverted. Only an examination following the principles of nature and reason can give them a secure foundation. The political animal breaks through the politics of ashamedness. It demonstrates that people as a rule are ashamed for the wrong reasons, for their physis, their animal size, which in fact are innocent, while they remain unmoved by the irrational and ugly practices, their greed, unfairness, cruelty, vanity, prejudice and blindness. Diogenes turns the tables. He literally shits on the perverted norms. Before the eyes of the Athenian market public, he used to do what concerns not only Demeter but also Aphrodite. Translated, shitting, pissing, masturbating, possibly fornicating too. The later Platonic and Christianized tradition, which suffocated the body under shame of course, could see only scandal in this, and centuries of secularization were necessary before the philosophical core of significance in these gestures could be approached. Psychoanalysis has done its bit for this rediscovery by inventing a language in which anal and genital phenomena can be spoken about in public. Precisely this, on a pantomimic level, was demonstrated by a Diogenes for the first time. If wise persons are emancipated beings, they must have dissolved the internal instances of oppression in themselves. Shame is a main factor in social conformisms. The switch point where external controls are transformed into internal controls. With his public masturbation, Diogenes committed a shamelessness by means of which he set himself in opposition to the political training and virtue of all systems. It was a frontal attack on all politics of the family, the core of all conservatism, because as tradition ashamedly has it, he sang his wedding song with his own hands. He was not subject to the compulsion to get married to satisfy his sexual needs. Diogenes taught masturbation by practical example, as cultural progress, mind you, not as regression to the animalistic. According to the wise man, one should let the animal live, insofar as it is a condition of the human. The serene masturbator, if only one could drive away hunger by rubbing the belly, breaks through the conservative social economy without vital losses. Sexual independence remains one of the most important conditions of emancipation. Diogenes, the political animal, raises existential presence of mind to a principle that finds its most concise expression in the phrase, be prepared for anything. In a world of incalculable risks, where accidents and changes make it too difficult to plan, and where the old order can no longer deal with new events, the biophilic individual is left with scarcely any other way out than this streamlined phrase. 
politics is that activity in which one has to be ready for anything. Social life is not so much a safe retreat as the source of all dangers. Presence of mind, then, becomes the secret of survival. Those who need little can manoeuvre against political fate when they have to live in times in which politics determines our fate. Politics is also the sphere in which people beat each other over the head because of the competition for non-essentials. The full repercussions of cynical anti-politics first become clear in times of crisis. If we now pass on to the next figure in our cabinet of cynics, we will see how things become complicated as soon as the philosophers, or better, the intellectuals, no longer keep to cynical abstinence, but seek bourgeois comfort, and at the same time try to reserve the prestige of the philosopher for themselves. Diogenes, who embodies his doctrine, is still an archaic figure. Modernity begins with splits, inconsistencies, and ironies.